Okay, so welcome to the first lecture in, in web engineering, which will be the only live lecture that is not in the classical uh, or non-classical uh, flip classroom model. That This will be a more classical lecture where I will tell you a little bit about the, um, an overview of the web and the language, basic language of the web, um, HTTP. So the contents will be uh, a very quick, very brief history of the internet and, and the web itself. And um, it will be then more focused on HTTP, which is the language of, of web communication. Let's see. And what I want you to learn today is describing how a client, meaning your computer, meaning your phone, meaning uh, any device on the internet basically uh, interacts with the web server. Yeah? Uh, I want you to, to know after this session how to request resources from these servers and understand the responses. Uh, I want you, if you look at the URL, to uh, describe their different components and understand what they are, and also to understand and use different headers in the HTTP product, protocol. So very, very briefly, we're going to look at, at uh, uh, historical developments in the field. And it starts uh, approximately in 1945 with uh, Vannevar Bush, uh, where the first mention of, of links were made uh, between documents in a mechanical device they called Memex at the time for memory extension. And uh, 20 years later, uh, we, we have Ted Nelson that looks at, uh, at uh, a file structure for, uh, for complex documents. And that was the first time we, uh, we saw the term hypertext being mentioned, basically. And uh, hypertext then becomes a, a bit more, more popular. And in 1968, uh, we have the first implementation of such a hypertext system by Engelbart, which is uh, one of the pioneers in, in the human computer interaction. In 1969, uh, we become a bit more technical and we have the first operational uh, network for, for packet switching, basically, which is sort of the, the precursor to the, the modern internet uh, within the ARPANET. Then in 1974, we have uh, basically the introduction of uh, the transfer uh, control protocol. So if you've had any lecture before on how networking works, uh, you've heard of TCP before. If you haven't heard of TCP before, it's basically a way of, of um, it's, it's talking over a network uh, in, a, in a more redundant and, and, and more, not secure, but in, in a way that uh, network interconnection works more safely, let's say. Then in 1978, we have uh, the first mention of the internet protocol. In 84, we get the domain name system, which is the way that we can officially interact with the web, namely by typing names into, into browser windows and then getting uh, pages back. And in 1989, we have uh, a paper by Tim Berners-Lee uh, that, that sort of opens up the, the birth of the internet with information management proposal, which was an internal paper at CERN at the time with CERN being a larger organization. And it was about uh, creating a, a document management system uh, over this interconnected networks. And in 1990, we have uh, the first browser. However, it wasn't graphical, it was on a command line. And then the first graphical browser was uh, in 93, which was called Mosaic, which also was a precursor to uh, Netscape at the time. In uh, 94, we have um, more uh, beyond researchers and, and military, we, we see adoption of the internet uh, with, with dial systems from CompuServe and AOL in the US. Uh, we have the founding of the W3C, which is uh, the World Wide Web Consortium, which deals with standards uh, on the internet and about the web. And we have the first, let's say, more mainstream browser coming out, which is the Netscape Navigator, which in some way it could be seen as a, as a precursor to uh, today's Mozilla. And in 98, we have uh, Google being founded in, in Menlo Park, um, basically from a, a spin-off from a, a DARPA grant at, at Stanford back then uh, with their paper on the page rank citation ranking. And this is one of the papers that I mentioned earlier, uh, information management, uh, a proposal from Tim Berners-Lee. It's uh, at first, it was an internal paper uh, at CERN where they talk about you know, all the chaos ensuing with uh, document management and, and how, how you can deal with, uh, with the complexity that comes up with managing all these documents. And 
basically they, they took the idea of hypertext that, that has been introduced in uh, first the 40s and then the 60s and, and 70s of, of how we can deal with, um, uh, with different kinds of documents and how we can uh, um, deal with uh, information man management systems. And that's also what, where the idea of the link you know, came to be within the internet. So it, the, the link itself and the way that we interact with, within websites, for instance, has had its roots uh, already since the 60s, basically. And this is uh, the Mosaic browser, which um, uh, also, interestingly, if you, if you think about it, it's been uh, um, pretty much 30 years uh, since this came about. And our modern web browsers uh, do so much more in the background, but they look pretty much the same, right? So the metaphors that we use um, within the internet have, have stayed pretty consistent over uh, the last three decades, basically. Uh, while in the background, you know, we, we've made some progress. Uh, there has been a lot going on in terms of browser internals. So the browser itself nowadays is, is uh, more like an operating system than anything else. Okay, before I move on, I see there are a couple of questions. Let me see. Uh, uh, so uh, owner asks uh, wh whether uh, you should read these articles. You don't have to read them for the sake of this course. I, I think they, they may be interesting. I'm just pointing them out to you for historical co context. Um, and uh, then there, there's questions about, about history between HTML and XML. Uh, Richard says that XML was after HTML. Um, I, I'm honestly not, not sure what the genealogy of this is, whether XML was, was sort of introduced after HTML. Um, my, my vague memory on this is that uh, XML got pretty huge in the late 90s and early 2000s as an exchange format. Uh, whereas HTML was has already been established uh, before that. I'm not sure if, and, and then, you know, we had a standard where, where XML is a, is a superset of, of HTML basically and HTML being a specialization. Uh, but I'm not sure what the history of this was, right? But um, yeah, this is something you can look up. N not super important for the lecture. This is more of a slight introduction. Okay, yeah, so, so Jan found the right uh, Wikipedia article. So if, if you look at um, if you look at the standard generalized markup language, uh, this, this was the precursor for both XML and, and HTML. Thank you, Jan. So then if we look at, at the internet itself, right? And this is the only time probably, maybe one of the few times where I will cite Wikipedia, but Wikipedia has you know, a very specific sentence about this. The internet is a global system of interconnected computer networks that uses the internet pr protocol uh, suites, namely TCP IP to link devices worldwide, okay? So there are a few important concepts here. One is TCP that I quickly mentioned before. Uh, TCP is a connection oriented protocol, meaning that it, it establishes a point-to-point a, a -point connection uh, between two units within a network, two, two entities, and uh, uh, allows them to interact with each other uh, in a connection oriented way. And then we have IP, which is the, the principal communications protocol uh, to deliver packets across this network, right? And then we have the, this other thing called an IP address. And in order for two entities within a network to, to talk to each other with TCP IP, they have to have uh, IP addresses uh, to establish that connection. So this is an example. So if, if, you, if you do a ping, ping is, is uh, you know, a facility on your command line that you can use, uh, it will allow you to to say, let's say ping or um, and it will give you an, a public IP address of, uh, of a domain. And in the case of TOV, and this is one of, their, um, one of their public IP addresses. So if we go back to 1973, you know, this was basically all of the internet back then, right? Which is also, an, I think an interesting historical tidbit. If you look at some of these, these notes, uh, they belong to universities, uh, other notes uh, belong to uh, uh, military facilities, and so on. Uh, there are some questions. Okay, no real questions in the chat. So let's quickly think about what happens if we type in any, any website on, on your browser. 
right? So if we go to the browser and we type in uh, www.google.it. So what happens uh, for that to, to facilitate all the requests and everything that's going on in the background, okay? So we do that, what's the first thing that happens? Anyone? You need to resolve the, the name through the DNS server, right? Exactly. So thank you, William. And thank you also people from, from the chat. Uh, the first thing that happens is you need to, to resolve the, this, uh, this uh, name to DNS, right? So this request, you know, I'm, I'm showing here a, a browser screenshot. This can come from a, a browser. This can come from some other server. This can come from uh, any device basically out there. If you send a request with a domain name, uh, the first thing uh, I think there's something wrong with your audio quality. It changed. Okay. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Probably microphone change or something. It should be the same microphone. Is it better now? It sounds dumb. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's okay. Now, now it's working better again. Okay. Say something. Uh, yes. Yeah. The... No, no, now it's clear. Okay. Maybe th there was a, a quick change in connection or something. Okay, but thanks for letting me know. Anyway, so, so if you go in uh, with a domain name, what will happen is uh, there's a, a pretty complex system actually that, that goes into place uh, that translates the domain name into uh, the IP address. Uh, what exactly happens in the background is not necessarily important for, for this course right now. Uh, we'll go a little bit through what happens in lecture seven on web servers. Uh, but for now, uh, trust the abstraction that says, I give you basically a, a function, right? I'll give you the domain name and you'll give me an IP address, okay? And once you have that IP address, uh, you know the, 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 physical the physical slash logical location of a server that you can then establish a connection with, right? So, and that server, uh, if, you, if you go through it through the HTTPS protocol, which we can see in, in um, the screenshot here, uh, we will expect that server uh, to wait for requests, right? So what happens is that we send this request through, through this protocol called the, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP. We send an HTTP request. We expect the server to understand the, that protocol and send back an HTTP response. If the server doesn't know what to, what to do, it will simply crash, it will give you back nothing, or it will give you back something nonsensical, right? So and we'll, we'll go through that in the beginning. But uh, in order for this to work, uh, as a client, I send an HTTP request and the server itself needs to be a web server that can serve web resources to me. And if that's the case, they can send back an HTTP response, which the client who sent the request can then also uh, deal with and so on and so forth. Now in the middle here, um, there's a, a whole lot of messiness going on that we're not gonna deal with right now, right? So there are a bunch of, uh, layers of, of proxies and and other uh, entities within the internet uh, that are uh, potentially interesting. But right now, again, uh, think of it as an abstraction that, that, that works uh, good enough that when you send a request to a certain IP address and that IP address uh, hosts a web server, basically, then you will get back a response. And if you want to see a little bit of the messiness that's going on, uh, I can suggest you go, you uh, try trace route of let's say Google AT or any, any other uh, website. So there are a couple of questions that are coming up. Yeah, so the, the question is uh, whether there, there is a certain um, uh, course that, that deals with all that. And, and the answer that, that you all gave is, is uh, exactly right. So in distributed systems, for that system, uh, you, you will learn about all these in more detail. Uh, right now for web engineering, let's trust that those systems work. They don't always work, but let's trust right now that they work. And if you want to know more about it, I think distributed systems is, is the right course for it. Okay. And now let's talk about HTTP. So HTTP is uh, a protocol that is built on TCP IP. Now, before we move on, I think maybe that there's maybe a quick question into the, into the group. Does everyone know what a protocol is? Can, can anyone? give their, their um, you know, one sentence answer of, of what a protocol is. 
is an uh, agreement between a client and a server how to communicate with each other. Yes, that's a that's a very good answer, uh, especially for for one. Uh, Diego also also good answer. A standard to communicate, standardized communication community payments. Very good. Yes, exactly. So a, a protocol is is an established agreement uh, on on how how we communicate. As 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 people, we have similar agreements, but they're a bit more complex. If I talk to someone, we're in the same cultural divide, but then uh, we have cognitive abilities that if we go a bit off uh, our protocol, we'll still understand each other in some way. Uh, in in protocols. Uh, that where machines talk to each other, uh, they have to be a lot more strict. And so these, these protocols are, are very delicately described and handled uh, by standards. So HCP also is, uh, is described in the standard and is very um, standardized. Exactly. Uh, and HCP is a, a synchronous request response protocol, meaning that, you know, as we see on the right side here, if you send a request somewhere, right, okay, and then uh, you get a response back, you know, request response. And, and the, the web server should answer with an appropriate answer if they can do it. Now, the thing with, with HTTP is um, while you may think, well, with using the internet, that, that it's probably a stateful protocol because everyone knows who we are, it's actually a stateless protocol, meaning that each request and response pair that we have is totally independent from each other. The way we mimic um, certain uh, stateful notions with HTTP is by sending inf private information about ourselves to the server. This usually happens through session IDs that you send, happens through cookies and so on and so forth, right? So if you think that, well, a lot of the things that I do on the internet are stateful, uh, you're right, but we, we mimic the statefulness. The HTTP protocol itself is stateless in the way that it operates. And, and if you read the the pre-reading for, for uh, this lecture. Um, if you haven't read it, uh, it's no problem this time. Uh, just uh, just uh, read it after. Uh, HTTP itself, while it's very simple in, in the way that, that uh, you can understand it, there are a lot of more complex things going on when it comes to uh, things like caching and, and proxying and so on and so forth. So I think it's worthwhile to, to read that article to see what the capabilities of HTTP are uh, beyond the basic re request response style uh, things that we can do. And the other thing is that in HTTP, uh, every request is sent uh, in clear text, right? So if you only use HTTP and not HTTPS, everything that you, you send, every request that you have, every header, everything uh, within those request response pairs will be visible to everyone on the internet. So just be aware of what's going on there. So if at all possible, in any sort of situation where you have that control, use HTTPS because that's at least um, send over a secure connection, namely TLS. Okay, which brings us to uh, something called resources. So if we think of HTTP and we think of a browser, uh, the way that the, the, historically the internet evolved, we potentially think of a file system, all right? Which what I wanna tell you here is, do not think of a file system because it doesn't have to be, right? So, it, so while historically we, we've been, uh, because of the way the URLs are constructed, we think of, of uh, a web server as just being a file server that we can access on the web. This is not the only way that, that the, the web can operate with HTTP. So the main way of, that we can think about HTTP is through the lens of resources. And resources are an abstract concept for nodes in the hypertext. So those are documents, images, files, uh, those are other resources, like things on a, uh, within a database um, and stuff like that. And those resources, um, the types of those resources, the data types, are defined through so-called MIME types within RFC uh, 2045. Uh, so maybe you've seen this before. You may have seen text HTML, image PNG, uh, application JSON, application XML, and so on and so forth. So those specify the type of that resource. And Together with a resource, we have the uniform resource locator, which is the standard way of, of um, addressing that resource basically, right? And this is the way, uh, this is a very abstract way, quite frankly, of how uh, URLs work. So we have uh, a scheme and uh, the, the main part you need is a server on a certain port within a path and a query. 
So this is very abstract. So maybe let's let's go to the next slide and see a concrete example. Um, so if we, if we put this into a concrete example, uh, this, by the way, doesn't exist. This is a, a, a fictional example that, that uh, I came up with. Uh, on the, but we can go here from the left side to the right side. We start with the, with the scheme, which is basically the protocol. So while URLs are, are I would say, mostly used for HTTP and HTTPS, uh, the, the scheme or the protocol that you use can be any protocol uh, that supports this URL-based uh, resource um, linking. So the first thing you would describe is, is, um, is the scheme. However, you know, it doesn't have to be HTTP. Uh, a lot of times, maybe you have seen FTP before, right? The file transfer protocol. Uh, potentially you've, you've seen um, SSH before or, or, or Samba, which is a file server. Uh, but there are a, a lot of other uh, protocols that can be used. However, for this course, uh, you can uh, be safe in the assumption that it works with, we're gonna work with HTTPS mostly. Uh, someone is not muted, by the way. Let me quickly check whether you're muted. Okay, uh, then the other optional thing you can, you can pass uh, in within the URL is uh, a username and password. So this is, uh, are things that you um, often see uh, from a web file server, you see it from FTP, you see it from maybe Samba, right? Uh, you rarely see this for, from regular HTTP resources, but it's it's part of the of the base syntax. Uh, then the most important thing is the server. So in here, you, you can either provide a domain name, which is then resolved through DNS, or you can provide directly the IP address. Uh, then you can provide a port. If you don't provide a, a port uh, on the standard web browsers, the po the port will be um, the default port is port eighty, which is the, the the default port for HTTP. And then, or, okay, let me reframe that. Because most of the requests are HTTP or HTTPS, the default port is, is 80 or 4, uh, 443, I think. Um, however, it depends on the scheme. So whatever scheme you have, uh, so, so the port you have, the default port you have is dependent on the, on the scheme you have. So after you define the server and potentially a port, uh, again, you can provide a path. So the path is, is uh, this, this way of thinking within a file system. So it's the local path to a resource on the server. However, it doesn't have to, to be mapped to a physical file system path in your server, right? Remember that, okay? So, so if you um, have a web server, the way you map your, uh, your path is independent of the underlying file system, meaning that you can map whatever string you want in whatever slashes you have, right? To some resource on the server, which doesn't have to have the same layout on the file system. Uh, then you have a query, meaning that you can pass parameters. In this case, the, the parameter is, is the year, right? And then last but not least, you have the fragments, which is mostly used for, uh, for the client. So the, the fragment shows you components or, or links to components within one document. Right? So this is not something that where the server does anything differently, right? Uh, this is something that, that you tell the client to do some other visual representation, for instance. And if you want to have a real example instead of this, this fake uh, tennis club uh, example, uh, this is TIS. So HTTPS is, is the protocol. Then we have tis.tovina.cat as a domain name. Uh, we have education, course, course, registration.html as the path. And rest assured that education uh, slash course is not a, a file system path on the TIS server somewhere, right? This is just a logical path, uh, if you will. And then after the question mark, we get the parameters. So course number and semester are the, are the parameters that you pass. And in this case, we don't have a fragment. Oh, I see there are questions. Uh, 443 is correct. Okay. Um, is, it is it required to go over HTTPS to use the HTTP2 protocol? Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, let me let me note that down and I can put it in the, the tool forum for you. I don't think so. Because I, I've, I've seen people using HTTP with HTTP2, I think. 
but uh, I'm not entirely sure. So I, I can look this up, whether, um, whether it's required to, to be an HTTPS for HTTP2. All right. Okay, so now that we, we know a little bit what HTTP is and we know what, what the URL is or, or um, you know, what resources are, let's talk about requests and responses. So an HTTP request refers to a specific resource that is identified by one of these URLs, right? It means, so that, that says, which resource are we retrieving from that server? It has a certain method uh, with the mo most common methods being get, post, and put that tells uh, the server how we want to uh, retrieve that resource. And it can contain an application body. So not every request that you have has to have an application uh, body, but if you, um, if you send data from a form, for instance, on, um, in your web browser, uh, that, that data is sent through post or put usually, and uh, that's the payload uh, or the application data of that request that you're sending. Uh, and then you can also send uh, a lot of metadata over a request, meaning that you, you can, you can uh, content negotiate. You can say, well, I want to have that resource, but I want to have that resource as JSON. And then the server can respond to that. The server can say, well, you know, I don't have that resource as JSON, but you, do you take XML, right? So these are certain things that you can do. And Oh yeah, and, and we also can define the, the data type of the, of the body if we're sending data. Oops, that was the last one. Uh, and there are questions. Okay, so if you look at, at the chat, uh, um, we have uh, Otto and, and Jan talking about HTTP2. Um, the standard of HTTP2 does not uh, require the use of encryption, but all major client implementations in the major browsers uh, have stated that they will only support it over TLS. So en encryption with HTTP2 is de facto mandatory. Okay, yeah. Thanks for for providing these resources. And I don't have to, I don't have to put them on the forum anymore. That's great. Okay, but going back to the re requests. So we'll, we'll look at an example in, in a quick second, but a lot of the requests that you do are get requests, meaning that you, you send a request to uh, a server and you will receive a re response without sending any, any um, application data to that server. And if, if you do wanna send application data to the server, you do it over these other methods, uh, posts or, or put for instance, where you also send an application body and specify the type of that body through a MIME type. And yeah, so, so here is a bit more detail on the request methods. There are quite a few of them. I think the, the main ones that, that you need to know right now are uh, get, post, uh, and, and put probably. Uh, and in most cases, you will be fine with, with uh, get and post. However, you should know the distinction between the others. So if you go through that a little bit. So if you have a get request to a resource, uh, then that should only retrieve data. And that should be safe and repeatable. So the standard says that if you provide a get resource, uh, no side effects should happen visibly at least for the user. So if you send a get request over and over to the same resource, you should retrieve the same resource over and over again. However, the reality of, of the web is a bit different, right? A lot of times if you send a get request, um, the server will track something about you like your IP address or uh, cookie data that you have and so on and so forth. So it's unfortunately not as black and white. Uh, however, uh, visibly you can expect uh, the request that you do to have no side effects, but technically there's certainly side, side effects for most get requests that you put out there. Uh, if you design your own web service uh, and we will you know, go through that in approximately lecture um, seven and eight, uh, then you have to think about these things of what the expectations of users are. However, if you use those things just, you know, you can, you, you can sort of expect that if you do a get request, nothing bad will happen. You know, nothing will be changed on the resource part. However, it's not entirely without a side effect. What you should definitely expect side effects are for things like uh, post, put, delete, and patch. So we can see some details here. Uh, for post, what that means is you submit data to a resource. And the data that you're submitting is part of the body of the request. And uh, oftentimes when you do post, it means that you're creating a new resource. So let's say you have uh, an application that uh, stores 
I don't know, um, stores ice cream flavors. And if you have a form that where you say, well, I want to have a new ice cream flavor and you add uh, pistachio for whatever reason, right? And, uh, and you add whatever other data you have and you, you send, you know, send this over, uh, then you usually would send this as a post request. And then the server would know, okay, I'm, I'm receiving a post request. And uh, what usually happens is then that the server can read this request. Uh, it will do something on the server. It, it will have some side effects. It will write to a database. It will write to a file. It will connect to another server and, and will give you a response back. And, that, and there, there's some subtle differences now between post and put, for instance, uh, slash put and patch also. So uh, if, you, if you do a post, a lot of people use posts for, for both creating new resources, but also editing existing resources. However, if you want to be you know, clean to the standard of HTTP, you should use put to, um, to replace it, the, the resource with new data. So if you use put, then, you, then the payload that you have in your application body in the HTTP request will be used to replace the data that you have on the server in whatever way you have it, or that's the standard at least. And exactly, so, so if you use uh, put and delete, those two should be uh, idempotent, meaning that uh, every time you, you, um, you send that, if you resend the put request or the delete request 100 times to the same server, uh, the state of the server after each request should be the same. Meaning that if you, if you uh, send a put um, with a certain payload, you know, it will only change the payload. If you send a delete of a resource, well, you can't delete the resource more than one time. So potentially you will get an error, but it will not change the state of the server. And now patch is interesting. You don't see patch very often. So uh, oftentimes if you look at, at public um, uh, HTTP APIs, you will see patch very rarely. Uh, but if, if you do, um, what it means is that within the patch request, you send instructions to the server on how to modify the certain resource. So instead of having put, which says, here is all data you need, you know, exchange these data points. Patches is, is, is a bit more interesting because it, it tells the server, here's how I want you to do this, right? Which sort of goes against the grain of abstraction where, where uh, you sort of have to know something about the representation of that resource within. And then you have a couple more uh, interesting uh, things on in terms of metadata. I think the only interesting one for us is the head request. Um, so we will see in a second that if you have um, if you have requests sent out, you know, requests and responses, then uh, what you will get back is uh, a, a response header. So every, every every request and response that you have has a header. And if you send a request and get a response back. If you set the, the, the head metadata, you will only get the, the response header back and not the full body. So you, you potentially can use this for debugging. You can use this for monitoring, for instance, where you say, well, I only, I only want to know whether the service is up. I don't really care what the payload is, stuff like that. Uh, I see we have two questions. Is the post slash put method similar in the way data is handled? Um, so, so that's totally up, up to um, the server, right? So, so um, on, on the server, you will get the HTTP requests and the method will be either post or put. And the request itself, I, I would say is very similar, right? Because it, it contains the whole uh, body of the, of the resource in some way. It's oftentimes like a, a key value pair uh, where you update a row in a database or, or, or updates um, resources in, in some way. So if I understand the question correctly, then, uh, then at least in a shape and form, post and put are very similar. The purposes for, for what they're used are different or should be different. People use them interchangeably sometimes. Okay. Oh yeah, so a few examples of, of how these uh, request headers look like. Uh, so you, you have this thing called accept, which uh, you know tells the the server uh, what kind of response you're you're uh, expecting basically. And uh, I say, well, I want to have this resource, but I, I uh, expect it to be in the form of JSON. And um, sometimes maybe in, in some web frameworks you've seen that 
for the same resource, you can provide different different uh, response types, and this is the way that th these things are handled, right? So instead of having uh, different URLs for, for different data types, let's say you, you don't have a, a different URL for getting HTML and getting JSON and XML, you just say it's the same resource, but I, I, I have a different accept header uh, within the request. Uh, then we have the, the content type. The content type uh, in, in the cases of post and put tell the server what they should be expecting. So if uh, as a server, I read the content type is JSON, I can instantiate the JSON parser uh, in, in order to read what's in the body, basically. Um, you can say accept encoding, which uh, uh, tells the server, um, you know, whether they should, they should um, gzip it, for instance, and stuff like that. And then this is important for A0, for your, your uh, you know, sort of first exercise, you can uh, send authorization headers. You can say, um, as a server, I, I can say that only authorized uh, requests can pass, basically. And for that, you have to send an authorization uh, header with a method and credential. So this is an example, right? So, so if I have a, a basic authentication, I say authorization colon basic, and then I, I pass on uh, this, this key with it. And what you can also do within the request header, you can send cookies. And this is an example. So HTTP is a completely textual protocol. Uh, if you inspect packets of HTTP, you will see exactly this. You will see the request header um, that very strictly says, well, you're going to start with a method. You have, a, you have to have a URL, and then you have to have um, the version of HTTP. And then after that, every a uh, request header comes with request header key, colon, request header value, right? So if you look at this, it's always the same structure. Then after defining all the request headers, we have a blank line, and then we have an application body. Okay, and now we get to the response. So the response is uh, only, so, so there's no way that I can, as a server, I can just send responses to some client um, uh, without any requests. So uh, a response always follows a request message. This is how, you know, also TCP uh, in the underlying process works, where you say you establish a connection through uh, um, TCP IP, and then, uh, which sends the HTTP request, and, on the, you know, and then we can send back the HTTP response. The, the response contains a status code. This is something you've probably seen. Uh, on the right side here, we have um, the categories of, of status codes. Uh, 1x for informational, 2x for success, 3x for something is redirected resource-wise, uh, 4 is a client error with the most common one being 404, and uh, 5x is a, a server error of some kind. So that's, maybe you've seen that before, if something crashed on the server somewhere, you get, oh, you know, we have an internal server error with a code 500. Okay, and uh, the response itself, uh, not only has the status codes, but we'll also have an application body, which gives you the payload of application. In the simplest sense, we have um, HTML, which then gets rendered by the, by the browser. We can have JSON or XML, which are data exchange formats. Uh, but you know, things like images and audio and video, uh, all these things also get transported with HTTP. So um, if, you, if you get any sort of research from, from the internet, uh, usually it's transported to HTTP and it's transported through the response to your client. Uh, here are some examples of, of response headers um, that are, are maybe not super basic. So uh, you can define uh, when something expires. You can say that, well, I know that this resource uh, will be good for, for another two weeks. So you send this expires uh, um, um, response header with it. And then this is used by, by clients or intermediaries uh, for caching. So if you have a uh, um, expires that, that you know, is valid for a couple of months, then potentially uh, some intermediary in between uh, or your client will say, well, if someone requests this resource from me, I know through this header that I, I can send a cached version back for the next you know, time. And you have things like last modified, um, the content type, meaning that, you know, what, what sort of content we're sending. And uh, you can also always set a cookie. So, so don't think of cookies as, as something that only clients have. Uh, cookies are a communication form between server and client, and client and server. 
Meaning that while a client you know, can certainly set cookies and send them with each request through HTTP, um, a server in this HTTP response can say, uh, you know what, dear client, save a cookie for me. You know? And whether the client does that is completely in, in the client's response. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, browsers, uh, uh, depending on how you configure them, will, will save the cookie for, for the server. And here's an example um, of the HTTP response. It uh, looks very similar to, uh, to the request in its form. Uh, the first line is the HTTP version and then the, the status code with a status message. And then we have key value pairs of the metadata on the response. Then again, we have a, a line that separates the header and the, and the body. And then we have the, the, the body also completely in, in plain text. Okay, so lecture has go, gone on for, for quite a bit. Do people want to see uh, you know, a quick live demo of, of how HTTP works? Can you, can you give me a, wait, I, I can answer a question. Like, how, how do I do this? Okay, so I hear 14, 15, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so I haven't seen the no yet. So <laughs> I'm hoping that's the, uh, the vocal, the vocal minority is also the vocal majority. So let me uh, stop sharing the slides and actually go into sharing my command line. Second. Okay, um, you should be able to, to see my command line. Okay, and maybe something that, that I didn't show before, uh, I, I talked about traceroute. So traceroute, or first of all, I talked about ping. If you do ping, you do, uh, let's say, dash standard here. It, it will tell you uh, the IP address here, for instance. And uh, ping is, a, is a, a, the ICMP protocol that will send subliminal short messages to a, a service to see whether the service is up basically, right? So this is ping. Uh, then we also have this thing called traceroute. Uh, let's say, um, let's do Google first. Um, yes, uh, that will show us the messy in-betweens basically. So here we can see that we, we tra we're tracing Google, uh, how we get to google.com. Well, the first thing we have to do through, through this, this minute to endpoint at Tailbean. Then we go to this border endpoint at Tailbean. So here we're still at Tailbean at 2.26 milliseconds. And then uh, we go to this uh, probably BGP endpoint. Here we are in, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, sorry, the Czech Republic, obviously. <laughs> and, and, and so on and so forth. So this shows you a bit of the messiness that goes on on the internet that, that you don't see. Uh, another one, let's say, um, Helicom. Uh, so this will, will bring you to Germany, for instance, right? So, and, and then you'll see, you'll see all the hops between you and uh, wherever you need to go in terms of servers. So I think that's, that's pretty interesting to, just to know for you that um, there's a lot of things that are, that are hidden for you. Uh, there's a chat message. Are these the proxies? Uh, th those, those are usually routers, but, but um, can be proxies. So, so I'm, I'm not sure whether Vinetu, for instance, is a proxy. Uh, it could be, but look at them more ab abstractly as entities that stand between you and, and the server that you're connecting with. I think that's the way you should look at, at it for now. Uh, can be proxies, can be uh, routers, can be, um, can be bridges and stuff like that. Yeah, I can, I can show the, the, the Chrome thing uh, probably next time. Okay, then what I wanted to show is something else, namely, uh, uh, oh yeah, right. So we have this, uh, there's this thing called a request bin. I don't know if you know this, just uh, if you Google uh, request bin, uh, there, there are a bunch of those, I just use this one, uh, where you can, can spin up a server basically that, that observes whatever you're doing. So uh, I already spin, uh, spun one up here. And if I copy this and 
here to send an HTTP request from the command line, you can say curl, CURL, and without any parameters, uh, just send it to, to a URL, and this will send a GET request. Okay. So this is success true. And if you look at the request bin, this will show you that, that you know, someone sent something here. Right. And, and now we can, uh, but let's see, um, let's, oh yeah, let's send uh, a head request. So I, I mentioned before that you don't have to uh, get back the body. You can just uh, ask for the head. So you can say curl dash dash head and this URL. Oops. Right. And this, this gives you uh, the response header. So we, here we can say that this is 200 okay. And all the metadata that is being sent by that server by request bin. Now, what else we can do? Okay, what we also can do is uh, we can have a more verbose version. So if you say curl, uh, let's actually save the URL. And, uh, let's, oops, no, nope, that's not what I wanted. Sorry, okay. I need that. Okay, now we have that here. Yes. So if we say curl of the URL dash V, then it should. So that's the verbose mode. This will tell you, also tell you about a bunch of the intermediate steps that need to happen for you to connect to this URL. So if you do uh, curl with a dash V uh, parameter, you can see all those in-betweens also. All right. Uh, uh, I see there are a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, so so there are definitely um, curl implementations for for all major operating systems. So you should be able to use curl on Windows or Mac or Linux, for sure. Uh, what else can I show you? Um, I can show you. Um, let's say let's say we want to control the the method to send something. So if we say well dot dash x and get. URL, right? Okay, so, so that was in the get request. So if, if we look at and this here, okay, so that's just the get. Let's say uh, we wanna we wanna send a post request. Okay, so let's do that. So this is a longer post request. That I can send here. So what I'm doing here is um, I'm, I'm sending data. So in curl, uh, sending data is through dash d. Let's remove the dash v for now. Um, and then I say through the dash h what the content type is, and I send it to that URL. Okay, and I get success true back. And I, I can see if you look at here, we can see the post request here. And we can see, okay, so in, th in this case, uh, there is some issue with the uh, encoding. Yes, so this is this is through copy pasting. If you look at this from, from my notes app, I just copy pasted those things here and it, it, um, it wasn't the right encoding. Uh, and there are a couple questions here. Uh, yes, okay, yeah, so trace route is called trace RT in Windows. How long is this lecture going to be alive? Um, what do you mean by alive? So, so, so this lecture is going to be on YouTube for as long as YouTube is alive. Or do you mean how long this lecture will take? Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, whatever. I'm, I'm basically done. Uh, showing things. Um, let me see. Oh, I, I can maybe. 
Yeah, let, let me let me show you uh, two more things. So I think we can be done in like five minutes or so, five to 10 minutes max. Uh, let me show you how to set uh, custom uh, headers. So let's say we want to do curl, we do a put request. So with dash X, we, we define what kind of requests we're sending and we're sending uh, dot H and say, uh, whoops, authorization, basic. And in this case, just something random, right? And the URL. And if we go back here, we can see that here's a put request. And, and then if you look at the headers, let's increase this a little bit. Um, yeah, we can see that I, I sent this custom header. You know, this is going to be important uh, for, for A0. So if you want to do A0 for curl, it's also possible. Okay, uh, one more request. Uh, why is it uploaded to YouTube and not Tubel? Uh, not ad revenue. I'm, I'm not making any money from the YouTube videos. And uh, the, I think the ad should be disabled um, because it's more convenient, basically. Okay. Uh, and then maybe let me show you one last thing. So if you, so for each, for each uh, modern website we have, we have oftentimes, you know, uh, tens to hundreds of requests per site that we're uh, opening. So if you go to the standard.at, for instance, which is a newspaper in Austria, and we go to the developer tools. So yeah, every every browser that that, that you may have, uh, every modern browser usually has developer tools that help you uh, with uh, developing sites on the internet. Uh, for web engineering, uh, I would say, let's just use Chrome. It's cross-platform and uh, it's I, I think it's a pretty good browser. And uh, so if you go to Chrome uh, here, settings, more tools and then developer tools, there's this one tab called network, okay? And if we, I think we have to record the network activity. Oh, let me see. Yes, so if you look at, at, at network here, so all, all these things that you can see here, those are all HTTP requests. And you can see the, the status of them, right? Some of them are blocked through uh, my app blocker probably. Um, and most of them are 200. Uh, you can filter by things like show me all the JavaScript that are being loaded, show me all the CSS files, images, and so on and so forth. But as you can see that uh, with every site that you're loading, let's go to a, another. Um, with every site you're loading, you, you're loading oftentimes, uh, you know, up to 100 or, or more resources and, and, you know, we're not even done. Okay, so 